First, let me say that a lot of what I'm going to talk about is probably review for a lot of people here. Um, but I think that's good because sometimes I think we forget how much we know about things like this and we need to review and we need to take a step back because we also forget that our patients don't know all of what we know. And what's reviewed to us is new to them. And I think one of our greatest mandates as healers is to be good teachers. So bear with me while I go through some of the stuff that you probably already know. I'm gonna be talking about integrative medicine. Uh, I'll talk about it in a little more detail. What I'd just like to say at the beginning is um, just kind of forget everything you know about integrative medicine, all of your preconceptions about it, because it seems like it's taken on sort of like a holistic -y connotation to it, but really what it is, is it's everything's on the table. The reason I love integrative medicine is everything that we learned that works, everything that's been working for 3,000 years is applicable, and all the cutting edge science that just came out yesterday is applicable. And you could have one patient in the same day who's appropriate for both sides of that. And that's what we're going to be talking about in large part. We're going to be talking about a lot of different disorders. Um, and it's interesting times to be talking about this. So I started thinking about all of this specifically. So a few months ago, my family and I were home. It was a Sunday morning. And in our house on Sunday mornings, it's the same thing every Sunday morning. My wife and I and my kids sit on the couch with the newspapers and we watch all of the news shows for that week. You know, so this week with George Stephanopoulos and Meet the Press and that sort of thing. And it was the Sunday preceding the New Hampshire primary, you know, the first New Hampshire primary. And no matter where you are politically, I think we can all agree that this has been an interesting presidential. Yeah. So, so given the, the level of interestingness, we were anticipating a lot of talk about the candidates at the primary. But what they talked about during the entire program on all of the programs and what was all over the front page of every newspaper wasn't anything about the candidates that were in New Hampshire, all the reporters were talking about this epidemic of heroin that had taken over the state of New Hampshire and how horrified they were at what they found and the state's inability to cope with this. And what they were saying was, it seems like this has been coming for a really long time and nobody was dealing with it. It seems like people had plenty of notice about it and no one took any action. It seems like people were reluctant to talk about it. And that's why I think it's okay to review it now because we do need to be talking about it, right? Because we are behind the eight ball a little bit. And later on that day, a friend of mine called me, uh, who is a journalist, and she is writing a book about recovery right now. So she's writing this book and you know her training as a journalist teaches her to do tons and tons and tons of research and interview after interview and now remember she's not in the healthcare field she's writing about addiction and recovery but she hasn't been seeing patients for a long time so when she called me i could hear right away in her voice she was very emotional when she called and she said mike i can't believe the stories I'm hearing from people, the things that they're telling me about, the traumas that they have gone through. She, she, I just can't believe it. So, you know, I've been doing this. I'm really old. I've been doing this forever. So I'm like, yeah, of course, people who are in, you know, they've had traumas. But to her, it's all brand new, right? And so we're talking about it. And she had a lot of great questions. She's, you know, how is it that some people are able to get into recovery and some people aren't? And how is it that some people are subjected to some of these traumas 
and they don't seem to manifest any symptoms of addiction, and some other people do. And I don't understand, you know, a lot of people are telling me, well, you know, my mom was addicted, my dad was addicted, it's all in my genes, isn't that true? And she had all sorts of really interesting questions. And I said, you know what, John, this is all fair ground. These are a lot of interesting questions. And then she said, you know what, I mean, there's this one person that's really sticking with me, and she started to kind of well up a little bit. She had spoken to this woman that day uh, by the name of Amy. And Amy's now 25 years old, and she's about a year into her recovery. When Amy was four, starting at about four and going on for a few years, she was repeatedly sexually assaulted by her uncle over and over, frequently uh, at gunpoint, uh, and often with the muzzle of the gun forced inside of her. And she told me how Amy had then, at a young age, turned to drugs to sort of numb things out for herself and was now in recovery and she was trying to make sense of all this. And I said, all right, you know what, Jen, let's start kind of at the beginning. So I said to her, think about your, think about your brain. And what's the primary purpose of your brain? You said, I, she, I, don't, I don't get it. I said, no, it's, that's fine. I said, the primary purpose of your brain is to keep you alive. If you think about it evolutionarily, we needed a system as we were evolving to keep us safe from predators and also to point us in the direction of that which would facilitate survival for the species, right? So we needed to beware of tigers and predators that were out there, but we also had to be drawn towards things like nourishment and procreation. And it's a very delicate balance between the two of them. And it's mediated largely by this chemical called dopamine. And she said, well, wait a minute, stop. I hear that word all the time, dopamine. Everyone that I'm interviewing, every doctor I talk to, every nurse I talk to, every th psychotherapist I talk to, even patients are telling me about dopamine. What's this all about? Fair question. So dopamine is an amazing chemical. It's a neurotransmitter when it's in the brain. It's a hormone when it's in the body. As opposed to most neurotransmitters, which are either inhibitory or excitatory, it can be either one, depending on what it's doing. It's involved in cravings. It's involved in happiness. It's involved in fear. It's involved in movement. It's what gets you to move. When you think about diseases like Parkinson's disease, where people have trouble with movement, it's because dopamine pathways have become eroded. And pathways becomes an important part of all these stories. And she said, yeah, people keep talking about pathways. I said, well, because pathways are important, because connections are important. She said, what kind of connections? Connections between people? I said, yep, connections between people, but also connect connections in your brain. They're equally as important. She said, what do you mean they're as equally as important? Said, well, I'll get to that. But connections with people and connections between brain cells are really what's at its root. And dopamine pathways are important because the brain is an electrochemical organ. And I told her, that's going to be really important as we discuss this. Keep that in mind. People have tended to, over the past five to ten years, start thinking about the brain as this sort of soup of neurotransmitters. People talk about serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine just like they're floating around, but they're not just floating around. There are really important pathways upon which these neurotransmitters travel. I said, okay, so let's take it from there. So I said, well, first of all, we break it into, so this is balance, fight or flight if you're stressed, and then there's a reward pathway. So first we talked about the stress pathway. And so I said, listen, whatever it was, 10,000 years ago, our ancestors are out roaming the plain, and they see a tiger out here. If you were the kind of 
being that would sit there and say, well, there's a tiger there. I wonder what I should do about that. Why don't I sit here for a little while and ponder it? It would end up badly, right? So what happens is, bam, no, you go into fight or flight, and your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis fires, and dopamine surges, and a bunch of other chemicals like cortisol surge, and your body gets ready, and you get out of there, and you're done. And she said, okay, that makes sense. And then I said, and then a lot of the patients that we deal with now, I have this conversation with them that, you know, this is a great system if you have a circumscribed, discrete stressor like a tiger, which presents itself. You go into fight or flight, you run away, and it's over. So that was great 3,000 years ago, but today, People don't have one stressor like that that occurs and goes away. My patient's stressors are their kids and family and money and relationships and college and all sorts of things that go on and on and on. And so their stress system is on all the time. And if your stress system is on all the time, your brain starts to wire that way. And she said, well, wait a minute, why is your brain wiring? I don't get that. I thought that your brain wiring was genetically determined. And I said, well, it's partly genetically determined. It's genetically influenced. DNA is not determinative. DNA can be affected by your environment. But I said, so she accepted that. And then I said, now think about the wiring going on with this woman, Amy, that you were telling me about. At four years old, this man, in whom she should be able to put absolute trust, was subjecting her to this awful, awful stressor on a daily basis, and training her brain, that's the way it's gonna be. I better wire myself to survive in this sort of environment. Okay, so she said, that puts that into context for me. And then I said, well, dopamine's also involved in our reward pathway. So, just as much as we need to stay out of danger, we need to be involved in, in activities that, again, uh, advance our survival. So social interaction, sexual activity, eating good food, that's all mediated by dopamine. What happens is, I was showing before, a picture of one of our ancestors eating a big steak, right? So if you eat a big steak, what happens is part of your brain, called the ventral tegmental area, sends a bunch of dopamine to your nucleus accumbens. And when your nucleus accumbens gets hit with a big bunch of dopamine, it gets coded as something good and something that you should repeat and something that you should do again, because it promotes survival. So you get a bunch of dopamine that hits your nucleus accumbens, and then the nucleus accumbens sends some signals and creates pathways, connections with other neurons up in the prefrontal cortex. And when you get these signals up in the prefrontal cortex and in the form of serotonin, it makes you feel good. And she said, oh yeah, I've heard about serotonin, that's those drugs, the SSRIs. I said, that's right, that all plays a role. You start to see how this all comes together. So you can see how eating a big steak might have this effect and it can activate your pathways in the reward system. Uh, the problem is, now we have other things that activate the reward system much more vigorously than a big steak. And for some people, Oxycontin or Percocet or alcohol or whatever it is activates this pathway really robustly. And then I said, you know what, take example for alcohol because you brought up alcohol with me and you brought up this girl, Amy, that you were telling me about and how she was addicted to alcohol. And I said, compare her to someone else who hadn't been subjected to the stressors that she was. Let's say she had a monozygotic twin, an identical twin but you put them both in different environments. So her, one, her twin was brought up without the sexual act, 
assaults. And she was brought up as you described to me. Now you give them both alcohol. They're both gonna get the intoxicating effect of that drink. But Amy's gonna get the additional benefit of it calming down her hyperactive risk reward system. So you can see how even if they had the same DNA, the child who had been subjected to that horrible stress is gonna be more likely to want that relief from that hyperactivity in their brain. They're gonna want it over and over and over again. And she said, okay, that's starting to make sense too. So I said, listen, we're gonna talk a lot about dopamine because dopamine's involved in so many different things. It's involved in so many different disease states. We were talking about mood disorders and pain disorders and trauma and addiction and dopamine's involved in all of them. And it, the pathways start to form very early in life. And what I said, it, you gotta take into consideration also that the brain doesn't just come out fully formed. Our brain, compared to other species, comes out relatively underdeveloped. If you ever watch National Geographic or anything with your kids and the horses are born and right away they're walking and they can kind of deal for themselves, very different than humans. I had asked for some musical accompaniment and it came in late. So, um, so we come out, we're not really quite ready to take care of ourselves. It takes us a while to develop, but we're way more adaptable. So that's why you see certain species that can only live in one part of the world, right? You find certain birds that are only at the equator or certain bears that are only in the polar, but you, people can kind of adapt because this wiring, this connection, this brain development happens over time. And it happens from the back forward which I think is important to keep in mind because if you look at how this works, the back of the brain right there is the first part of the brain that develops. That's your primary visual cortex. That's why when you take the baby to the pediatrician for the well child visit, they're doing that thing where they're seeing if they're tracking. That's in part to see if that part of the brain is developing appropriately. Then you move forward and you see that sensations start to develop a little bit more maturely as you go and motor skills evolve after that and that's when the baby starts reaching for things and the baby starts to crawl and starts to try to take its first steps and things like memory and object permanence come later. And what's really important to keep in mind is that the part of the brain up here the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is involved in mood and judgment and executive function, doesn't fully develop until you're about 26. She said, well, that's a long time. Said, yeah, it is. That's why you're not allowed to rent a car until you're 25. <laughs> it's true, because they've done the numbers and they can do stuff like that, because what are you gonna do? Say, no, I'm gonna deal with another, no, that's, the, that's the way it works. But here's the thing. Now we're talking about this girl Amy at four and it becomes really relevant because you're thinking she's subjected to all this stuff before there's any wiring there. But think about how broadly this applies to so many people that we treat. If you've ever had the privilege of treating soldiers who have been deployed overseas, how old are they on average? Maybe a second over 19? and their whole life when they're over there, what's their job? Don't get killed. Because the other people that are there, their whole job is to kill you. And then we wonder when they come back and they're still about seven years away from developing the part of their brain that's involved in judgment and mood and executive function hasn't been fully developed. We wonder why do they have higher rates of suicide and alcoholism? Or police officers, first responders. I grew up in New York. When everything hit the fan and no one knew what to do, what would you do? Call the cops. And some 20 year old kid would show up and try to take control of some sort of horrific situation. And I've also had the privilege of treating police officers and firemen and some of the stories they tell me about things that they saw 
their first year on the beat. It's horrifying. And again, that part of their brain hasn't fully connected. They're still all amygdala and brainstem and reaction. And if you look at first responders' rates of addiction and suicidal ideation, way higher than the general population. And she said, all right, so this is now starting to make a lot more sense in context to the people that I've been interviewing. I said, okay, good. So we talked about development a little bit more. And clearly, the brain develops in size. Like we don't have to be, you don't have to have studied medicine at all to know it gets bigger, right? You can see that pretty clearly. The thing is, is that size of the brain really doesn't matter. Even when you're fully matured, we used to think that it was brain size. Phrenology, the study of the brain, assumed that bigger was better. And when uh, Albert Einstein died and they autopsied him, uh, the average brain weighs about three pounds. His was 2.71 pounds. And everyone thought, well, how could that be? He's like the smartest guy ever. Turned out that his brain didn't weigh as much as other brains, but his synaptic density was much higher than most people. There were more connections between neurons in his brain than there are in most people. And those connections, as we'll talk about, that's what's important. The synaptic connections determine how we perceive the world, how we emote, our behavior, pretty much everything about our existence is about these connections between neurons. And these connections are forming. Every interaction that we have, we have a connection that occurs. That's one way to think about it. That's the wiring that happens. If you have a conversation with someone, there's a connection. If you almost get hit by a bus, there's a connection. If your uncle comes in when you're four years old and subjects you to what you just told me about, there's a whole bunch of connections. So we have to talk about a little bit, and I said, Jen, I'm sorry to bore you to death, I'll make this really quick, but we have to talk about the basic unit of the brain, which is the neuron, because these are how the connections are formed. So I said, listen, there's part of the brain, part of the neuron, it's just like any other cell, like there's the nucleus in the middle of it, and that's where all your DNA is. All the chromosomes have all your DNA. And every cell of the body has the same complement of DNA. And she said, well, that's weird that every cell has the same complement of DNA. How does one cell know to be a brain cell and another cell know to be a liver cell? I said, that's epigenetics. We're going to get into that in a little bit. But at this point, it's just you have to know that there are Parts of the cell responsible for receiving information, those are the dendrites. And there are parts that are responsible for sending information. And she said, okay. And one of the things that I said was, during this period of uh, development, one of the ways to think about it is just to make it easier. It's not exactly, you could kind of break it down into four stages. There's the stage where the progenitor cells split that's stage one. Stage two of brain development is when the cells migrate to the part of the brain they're going to live. Stage three is arborization. That's when it starts to grow these dendrites. Whoops. Let me go back here. Arborization is when these uh, dendrites and axons start to grow, and they look a little bit like branches off of a tree, so they call it arborization. Stage four is when the synaptic connections happen. And that's where we all come in. That's where we help guide those synaptic connections. That's where we help uh, those pathways evolve. That's how we help people interpret their being and respond to their being and augment their behavior. That's what happens. Because stage one, two, and three, there's not too much we could do about. It. Stage one, if uh, the cells don't split, you get babies born with microcephaly and they don't live. If stage something goes wrong at stage two, you generally get something called lysencephaly. That's when the brain uh, doesn't get the sort of sulci and gyri. It just looks really smooth. Babies are profoundly retarded 
and then tend not to live either. It's really their stages three and four, mostly four, that we can intervene and we can do something about. That's when these neurons start to work together in teams. And she said, in teams? I was like, yeah, neurons always work together in teams. They don't work by themselves, they work by forming these pathways. Now, every once in a while, someone will come along and they'll think that they've found that this isn't true. And there was a few years back when there was a bunch of stuff in the news about the Jennifer Aniston neuron. I don't know if anyone heard that. I swear to God, you can Google it on your phone. There was a story out of, uh, actually it was at UCLA. There was Dr. Freed, he was a neurosurgeon, and he was, he was also a researcher. And um, a lot of times when you're doing neurosurgery, you have to keep the patient awake because you have to monitor certain functions and you're asking the patient questions because the brain itself doesn't have any pain receptors on it. So he was doing some research while he was doing the neurosurgery and they were showing pictures to the patients while they were, uh, while they were under surgery and they were also measuring activity. And with every patient, they would show them Jennifer Aniston and there's like, they were getting a signal from one neuron. And they're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. So then they would show them someone who wasn't famous and you wouldn't get anything. Julia Roberts, nothing. Jennifer Aniston, it would fire again. And then it turns out that they figured it out and it was these long synaptic connections that had to do with white matter and it went down into your hippocampus and it wasn't just that one neuron. But anyway, every once in a while you're gonna hear that they, there's some discovery, that, just ignore it. They all work in teams, they work in pathways, they work in these connections that we're talking about. And these connections are being studied right now. There's actually a, a really interesting study going on. It's called the Connectome Project. Uh, it's being run by the University of Washington and the University of Minnesota and Oxford over in England and Princeton. There's a gentleman by the name of Sebastian Sung who wrote a book called Connectome. And what they're trying to do is figure out really how these pathways form, what they mean when they do form. They're trying to map the connectome the way we map the genome during the genome project. And it's a much larger project to undertake when you take into consideration there's a billion cells, there's trillions of connections. So they're starting with a rat brain, but it's a good start. And if you carry it out to its logical conclusion, could it help us? Yeah, at some point it might be able to because you can see how some of these connections are activated with some of these techniques that we have now like fMRI. We can see when different parts of the brain fire together. And there's the saying in neuroscience, neurons that wire together fire together. And so someday we're hoping that as we're treating a patient, say with depression, or PTSD, are those connections changing through the course of our treatment the way we want them to? Or are we not getting anywhere and do we need to change course? All sorts of things become possible when you start thinking about how science is advancing. That's why like now is the greatest time to be a neuroscience ever, because we're starting to look at all these sorts of possibilities. So when you get all these wiring together, that's what creates this sort of beautiful lattice pattern. This is what it looks like a little slice of brain tissue looks like under a microscope. And that won't look the same in any two people because the wiring depends on experience. That's why I was saying Amy's connections wouldn't be dictated just by her DNA. Those connections are dictated by the environment in which she was raised. And if she had an identical twin, her pattern wouldn't look like that. They would look completely different, which I think is deep, but it's, it's really hopeful. Because the thing is, if experience can change your wiring, and someone like Amy's wiring was dictated by the experience through which she went, then we can help also change that wiring through treatment. All sorts of treatment. And that's really hopeful. So, so we were talking about this a little more and we talked about things like depression stemming from early trauma and we talked about addiction. 
And uh, she repeated to me what she had said earlier in the conversation, which was, you know, a lot of people tell me that they're just kind of doomed because their mom and dad both drank heavily, their brothers drank heavily, it's in the family, they've got that gene, and genes kind of determine everything. And so if patients tell you that, that's not true. It's not something they're making an excuse, it's what they've been told, it's what I was told. When I was in medical school, we thought that genetics had a lot more to do with disease than it does now. It was so much, it was very dogmatic about it. It was kind of like, you know, the ancient Greeks thought that the essence of life uh, was this thread spun by these goddesses called the fates. And when I was in medical school, we were kind of taught that the essence of life was this thread spun into a double helix. And all these base pairs kind of determined everything. And that's why when we did the, the genome project, everybody was really excited because we thought once we figure out the genome, once we figure out that code for everything, we're going to be able to figure, solve all of our problems. And that was really great. But it turned out it didn't solve all of our problems. It gave us a lot of really good information. But there's so much that happens outside of the genome. That's what I was alluding to before. This whole burgeoning science of epigenetics is really exciting. Because it turns out that, yeah, we have this script. But it can be affected by outside experiences. And that's why certain cells know how to turn into different cells. There are signaling mechanisms. That's why there's not a 100% concordance rate between identical twins with diseases like schizophrenia. It's 50%. If it was all DNA, it would be 100%. So what I told her is think about your gene as like the hard drive on your computer, but think about experience and epigenetic markers as the software that tells your computer how to run. <clears throat> and if your computer wasn't working and someone came over and only looked at the hardware, said, well, it looks fine, it's still not working, you gotta look at both the hardware and the software. And so what we talk about is how we get genetic contributions from both of our parents in the form of different alleles, and they confer some genetic risk, but not genetic determinism. They inform the way the brain develops, but they don't completely determine it. And it's interesting also, as you look at development of the brain, so you look at birth, and you see that there are relatively few connections. The baby hasn't learned anything yet. It's had no experiences, no cause for these connections to happen. Then you start looking at the baby around seven years old. And I still call seven-year-old a baby because I have a seven-year-old and she's probably going to be my baby till she's 32. But anyway, at seven years old, you see a ton of connections. So dense, so many happening. And you would expect that to continue, but that's not what happens. Then you start looking as the child grows, and there are fewer connections at 15, and if I were to continue this slide out to the right, you would see fewer and fewer still. And there's a reason for that, is because the brain needs to sort of prioritize. At some point, you have to stop just making connections. You have to decide what's relevant to your survival. And it happens through a process called pruning. And we thought, she said, well, that's interesting. Well, how does the brain know what to prune and what not to prune? How does the brain know which connections to keep and which connections to cut away? And it turns out the connections that we keep are the ones that happen often and are significant. And the connections that we prune away are ones that don't happen very often and carry little significance. And I said, you know what, Jen? Now think about that girl, Amy, you were telling me about and how her wiring occurred. Often and significant. Four years old, every day, assaulted. Those wires are going to stay. Passing someone on the street, you're never going to see again. That connection goes away. And so she said, now this is, again, this sort of 
experience, this trauma at an early age, is making sense why someone would have mood disorders, addiction, problems in later life. The epigenetic mechanisms, I mentioned this just briefly because some people are interested in it. Um, this could be a five-day presentation about epigenetics. What I will say is this. I was saying you can look at the, the, the genetic code as the hardware, and we know, we can tell now, we can look, we know that under certain circumstances, certain genes are turned on and certain genes are turned off. And we're actually learning how to turn genes on and off with medication and other ways. And generally speaking, this is a broad generalization, generally speaking, acetyl groups turn genes on and methyl groups turn genes off, just generally speaking. So the trick is figuring out which are the protective genes, which are the deleterious genes, and figuring out how to turn on those that are gonna be protective and turn off those that are gonna hurt us. It's a massive task, but it's already underway. And we're actually utilizing it already. So, get back to all these disorders that we're talking about now, and everything becomes relevant. So where, where I work, we have five different programs. We have a chemical dependency program, a mood disorder program, an eating disorder program, a trauma program, and a complex pain program. And what I can tell you, and you probably won't be surprised to hear if you've been in this field for any length of time, there are like zero patients who fit very neatly into any one of these programs. When I was at the University of Connecticut in my residency training, I was on the first dual diagnosis team that they ever had. And that was like a really big deal at the time. And now, how often do you see a patient with just one diagnosis, right? Everybody with an eating disorder has some sort of trauma that they're gonna tell you about a week or two into their treatment. Everybody with pain that hasn't resolved, and this is, becomes particularly relevant now. If you've been watching television at all, you might have heard Prince died. And they're saying that he didn't die, he had chronic pain and they think it was a fentanyl overdose. Lots of people are dying of, because they're getting addicted to prescription pain medicine that they're taking for pain. And the pain management doctor that I work with, his whole philosophy is, listen, Mike, 90% of the time, our body and the skills that we have in treatment, we're able to resolve pain, at least to the point where people can live to it. It's that other 10% of the time, which he calls complex pain, where it doesn't resolve. And the key is trying to figure out what is it about that pain where it's not resolving? And what we do a lot of the time is try to figure out what's informing that pain. What sort of traumas have they not revealed? How is their mood disorder impacting on it? How are all these connections wiring for that person? that they perceive that they're in that much pain and they need that much medication. So there's a lot of overlap here and there's a lot of um, interplay between those two systems I was telling you about and there's a lot of interplay between genetics and epigenetic factors that result in these disorders that require a really intricate way of treating them. And so I'm of the school that the way of addressing all of these completely is through the implementation of integrative medicine. And that's why I was telling you at the beginning to kind of forget what you've heard about integrative medicine because what I've found is you can ask 10 different guys like me who purport to be an integrative psychiatrist, what's integrative medicine? And you get 10 different answers because it's traditionally really just been kind of whatever people said it was. And I grew up, I was telling you, I grew up in New York, I grew up on Long Island, and my parents were uh, kind of like, I guess everybody else's parents on Long Island. It was like, you know, it, when you grow up, you could be whatever you want to be, you could do whatever you want to do, as long as it's a doctor, a lawyer, or a stockbroker. And so a lot of my friends ended up going into medicine, uh, I was the only one who went into psychiatry, but when I would talk to my friends who were surgeons or ER docs, they would say, well, what is integrative medicine? What do you do, burn incense and bang on a gong or something like that? What that? And so, no, it's I, like I said, everything's on the table. But there are, 
in my mind, five basic tenets of integrative medicine. And the first one is that the relationship between the treater and the patient is paramount. It's the most important thing, I think. 